Hello everyone, this is David with Let's Talk Theology. I would like to thank you for joining us in our podcast. Thank you for being a part of the YouTube channel. I really hope everything is a blessing to you. I hope you are uh, excited about the new year. Uh, and we hope that you've had uh, plenty of time to set plans and uh, different goals for your theological studies and Bible reading. Um, it's very important that we make that a priority in this year uh, as we venture out to uh, strengthen our dedication to Christ. I believe that it is very important and is imperative to uh, further our Christian uh, walk, our spiritual walk with biblical studies. So we hope that you're excited. You're as excited as I am. I'm really looking forward to this year. I don't know what it's going to bring, but I'm very anxious to see how God will bless us and allow us to uh, grow in his word. All right. So Thank you for watching. Thank you for being a part of the YouTube channel. Thank you for all you're doing to support. And we hope that we can continue to be a blessing to you. All right, now let's get into our discussion for today. We're going to talk a little more about Frederick Douglass and uh, some of the things that he has allowed uh, me to see. Uh, some of the things he's kind of uh, brought to my attention uh, based on his book called The Narrative of Life of Frederick Douglass, a book that he wrote, an autobiography. A very intriguing, a very uh, enlightening book. Uh, this is a very special book. I have uh, a few books that I want to really get into as it relates to African American history uh, and their perception on religion and Christianity. Uh, and I think uh, by doing this, we'll be able to capture uh, a piece of the history within America that is uh, commonly overlooked and maybe pushed to the side. And it may give us an opportunity to see what things we can improve on in today's society. Uh, of course, there are all types of racial tension uh, that is existing in our society. Um, and I think that's, to, uh, that's due to the neglect of understanding the points of view that have already been presented in previous works and previous uh, historical facts. And... Um, what bothers me the most is the racial tension that exists within Christianity. And it's almost like the elephant in the room. No one wants to talk about it. Uh, no one wants to pay it any, any attention. But it's very evident, evident that it is there. So um, I think it's time that we kind of pay it attention. Uh, I know it may be painful. It may be uh, something that we don't want to do. Uh, but we need to pay attention to these things. And the reason being... Is because the way that the gospel is presented through the scripture, there is no way that we can allow this racial tension to continue on. We can't allow the segregation and uh, some of the things that happen uh, from day to day within the Christian uh, Christian uh, denomination or religion can allow it to go on and, and claim to hold to a biblical uh, doctrine or a universal gospel. So it's very important for the sake of the gospel, for the sake of Christianity, that we really look at these issues and try as much as we can to reconcile the racial issues that uh, uh, exist within uh, uh, modern Christianity, and particularly uh, American Christianity. And I think that's where reading certain books such as Frederick Douglass, W.E. Du Bois, uh, Booker T. Washington, uh, the old slave narratives, uh, all these things help us, even American history, even uh, uh, U.S. history, reading these things that help us understand how we got to where we are today. And also reading the Bible to figure out how can we address these issues from a biblical uh, perspective. I think Martin Luther King said it best that one of the most segregated hours uh, or time periods throughout the week is on the Sunday mornings whenever we're having our worship services. Uh, and one uh, sociologist said it this way, that the church is 10 times uh, more segregated than uh, the communities that they exist in. Uh, they are more segregated than the jobs that we work on, more segregated than the schools that we attend. And uh, that's a bit of a problem to me. Uh, I, don't, I, I just don't know how we can uh, claim to be a universal church. We can claim to say, serve the same Christ. Uh, we worship the same God. Uh, yet there is so much uh, division, so much uh, divisiveness. And um, 
We can blame it on culture. We can blame it on ethnicity. We can blame it on race and preference. But whenever it gets down to it, we have to be honest enough to acknowledge that if we are a part of the same body, there should be a certain type of communion, a certain type of uh, unity that exists among us that brings us together based on our belief. All right. Uh, so uh, there's some things we want to look at. And I, this is my motive for looking at these different uh, perspectives from respected authors such as Frederick Douglass and just kind of capturing their view. Uh, capturing what they were saying, what they saw, what they experienced, and uh, kind of pinpointing some of the things that I feel will help us in this uh, attempt to reconcile uh, all people together for the sake of the gospel and for the glory of God. All right. Now, I want to bring up a point uh, in, in, in Frederick Douglass, uh, his book, he made an observation on uh, American Christianity. And he had a problem with that, as we made known in the previous video. Uh, he had a problem with Christianity that he uh, viewed or, or he was uh, able to encounter and experience. And one thing I love about him is the type of discipline that he had to distinguish what he knew was true Christianity from what he was actually experiencing. That takes a very uh, uh, true discipline to uh, maintain your level of character. Whenever those people that are responsible for introducing uh, the expected character of of, of people and uh, of integrity, when they themselves actually uh, degrade themselves to a level that is not compliant with their own uh, doctrines, and so uh, Frederick Douglass had an issue with American Christianity. He was able to distinguish this type of Christianity from true Christianity. Uh, he compared American Christianity to uh, teaching that Jesus had when referring to the Pharisees and referring to uh, those ones who uh, sat in Moses' seat. And this is what Jesus said about the Pharisees. He said, uh, the experts in the law and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. Therefore, pay attention to what they tell you and do it. But do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they teach and this is what uh frederick De uh, frederick Douglass, excuse me compared uh american christianity to he compared them to the pharisees of jesus day he said american christianity is exactly what the pharisees were in jesus's day and basically saying that they were hypocritical and essentially they were ones that preached good doctrines but didn't in return uh obey their own doctrines and I guess I want to read a few portions of this out of his book to help us understand where he's coming from. He says, the man who robs me of my earnings at the end of the each week meets me as a class leader on Sunday morning to show me the way of life and the path of salvation. He who sells my sister for the purposes of prostitution stands for forth as the pious advocate of purity. He who claims or proclaims it is a religious duty to read the Bible, denies me the right of learning to read the name of the God who made me. He who is the religious advocate of marriage robs whole millions of its sacred influence and leaves them to the ravages of wholesale pollution. The warm defender of the sacredness of the family relation is the same that scatters whole families, surrendering or sundering husbands and wives, parents and children, uh, sisters and brothers, leaving the hut vacant and the earth desolate. We see the thief preaching against theft and the adulterer against adultery. We have men sold to build churches and women sold to support the gospel uh, and babes sold to purchase Bibles for the poor heathen, all for the glory of God and the good of souls. So you see the contradiction, you know, they're preaching one thing and doing the opposite of what they preach. Uh, and this is uh, becomes a problem because whenever you're a slave, you you're at the hand of these ones who uh, seemingly preach a good message and preach a good uh, a good exposition of scripture as we would say and uh, you know their actions are not suiting up to what true Christianity is all about well let's read further what he says the slaves auctioneers bell uh, and the church going bell chime in with each other 
and the bitter cries of the heartbroken slave are drowned in the religious shouts of his pious master. Revivals of religion and revivals in the slave trade go hand in hand together. Uh, the slave prison and the church stand near each other. The clanking of fetters and the rattling of chains in the prison and the pious psalm and solemn prayer in the church may be heard at the same time. The dealers in the bodies and the souls of men erect their stand in the presence of the pulpit and they mo uh, mutually uh, help each other. The dealer gives his blood-stained gold to support the pulpit and the pulpit in return covers his infernal business with the grab or garb of Christianity. And he says further, here we have religion and robbery, the allies of each other, devils dressed in angels robes and hell presenting the semblance of paradise. Now, we will look at this and say, how awful is that? How awful is it for a man to preach against adultery and then commit adultery? How awful is it for a man to uh, preach uh, against the division of the family union, but then sell slaves that are splitting up families in a way that they will never see their loved ones ever again? Uh, it, it just seems very drastic. All right, and we can all accept that. Uh, we, I think, at this point in time, we all think, or have come to the conclusion, for the most part, that slavery was immoral and absolutely unchristian-like, unchrist-like. It was totally against the Bible in any uh, Christ-like character. It didn't portray that. But I want to propose to you what is even more unchrist-like is the segregation that actually exists within American Christianity. I think it is absolutely immoral and is absolutely unchristlike for us to in any way have such high levels of segregation in the in the 21st century after reading the Gospels that helps us to understand that we are a body of people that ha are to have uh, similar or similarities rather that will allow us to tolerate the different cultures, the different ethnicities the differences within our preferences it should allow us to love each other enough to actually come together and worship with God now some people don't feel that that's necessary some people may even feel that it's not even biblical but based on what the scriptures state I believe that it is absolutely biblical for us to be together as one body and be seen all over the world as one group as one community under the kingship of Jesus Christ that's exactly what the first century did, even though they were in the middle of trying to bring together two uh, uh, opposing or two different groups of people, uh, the, respectfully known as the Jews and the Gentiles. Even though there was a, a transitionary period where the, 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 the unity of the covenant was coming together, it still does not erase the fact that Paul preached that there is no Jew nor Gentile, there's no male or female, that we are all a part of the body of Christ in one unit, in one community, we all represent the same Savior. Well, the problem is today is that whenever the people in the world look at us, they no longer see one Christ or one group of people. They actually see several different groups of people that serve several different types of Christ and have several different types of messages and several different ways of getting to God. There is no unity in the message that we, pre we present. There's no unity in the way we worship God. There's no unity in the way we live. So we're just as bad as those who are segregated in any other line of, of institutionalization because we as a church are just as segregated. Now, we would look at it this way. We would go to our job, and if they said, well, this is a company that only hire, hires black people, this is a company that only hires white people, and we're going to do it the way we want to do it in order to accommodate the race that we would uh, like to attract, we will automatically find problems with that. We will see that as being immoral and ab absolutely contrary to any Christ-like characteristic. But yet... But yet, when we go to church, we have preferences that are more attractive to certain races. We have preaching that's more attractive to certain certain people. We have buildings and different formats that attract people that we feel uh, we are more closer to. Uh, there was a, a, a revival or, or evangelist 
who wrote a book explaining the homogeneous uh, theory, which means people are more drawn to being saved whenever they are in an environment of people that are more like them. Meaning it is harder for a person to get saved if they are a minority in a group. So to accommodate the statistic of getting people saved quicker, we create an atmosphere of people that are of common race, common preferences, and common lifestyles so that they can feel comfortable in dedicating their life to Christ. I don't know if that's... I don't know... If that is it, if there's any good in that, it may be good in it for the moment and I can bear to see it, but I want to propose this. How do we get over the cultural barriers? How do we get over the racial barriers? How do we get over the uh, uh, subjective preferences? We do it by presenting a message that is universal. We use it. We do it by presenting the gospel of Jesus Christ and by doing so. All of the biases that we come to God with now becomes put on the side or absolutely diminished so that the gospel of Jesus Christ can do its perfect work in all of us in the same way. Because there's one thing that we have in common, no matter what color we are, no matter our gender, no matter where we came from, we are all sinners. And if we came to church or if we came together with the mentality that we are coming to deal with this sin problem that we all have. And we only have one solution by which this sin problem can be solved. Then perhaps we can get down to some things that will unite us together and make us serve the same God the same way. Because essentially we're all coming for the same reason. Truth of the matter is this. Not everybody in this day go to church or come together or serve God for the same purpose. And it makes it very hard for us to come together in anything whenever we have different motives and different alternatives. Or, or different ulterior motives we have different things that we're trying to do so we have all different types of com- competition all different types of options all different types of uh, a ways of getting what we desire most whenever we come together but one thing we find is in the first century church and more along the lines of uh, within the days of the apostles and jesus christ these people sought those ones who were true believers they sought a God that could help them with this problem of sin and with this problem of being disconnected with their creator. And the only way that they could get connected with God was by believing, trusting in the gospel and waiting for the the promise of Jesus Christ to come to pass. That's all they, that's all that mattered. Uh, That's all that they cared about. And they, they, they earnestly, spread they took this gospel all over the world to all different peoples all over the world because everybody realized that there was one problem that everybody had and that is a problem of sin or that's problem of death this problem that separates all people from god and there was only one way there was only one way that they could be united back to their creator and that's through jesus christ whenever that is your motive whenever that is your desire is to be connected to god by the gospel you can say like paul there is neither circumcision or uncircumcision there's neither jew nor greek none of these things matter what really matters is do you really believe in jesus christ and if i believe in jesus christ i believe that should be enough for us to unify together for us to come together and for us to be reconciled no matter what differences we have we are now united through Jesus Christ, and that is supposed to be strong enough. But we find today that that's not strong enough, and we have all different types of problems. So I want to encourage everyone: make Jesus Christ, make Jesus Christ the main thing. Make Jesus Christ what it's all about, and in doing so, we'll find out that we have more in common than we ever thought we ever had. My time is up. My video only lets me video for 20 minutes and I'm right at the mark. So I thank you all for your patience. Thank you for viewing. I hope this has been a blessing to you. Drop me some comments in the comment box. Share it. Post it all over the place. If you've enjoyed it, let me know what you're thinking. Continue to check out our videos. We're going to continue to post uh, and we're going to continue to try to spread this message of Jesus Christ. We thank you for watching. Subscribe for the YouTube videos. Follow us on Instagram. Follow us on, on Twitter. Follow us as we follow Christ. Thank you for watching and God bless.